Well, hello and welcome to uh, the next, oops, the next lecture, which is on consumption, which we now call tuberculosis. Long ago, <clears throat> 200 years ago or so, uh, it used to be called consumption. And the reason was that consumption or this disease consumed the patient. It slowly um, degraded them and uh, leading to an eventual death. So the origins of consumption or tuberculosis um, were like some of the other diseases very, very early in human history and emerged as, as a pathogen out of Africa. And then uh, it traveled along the migratory patterns of humans uh, out of Africa 70 to 100,000 years ago. And we do have evidence of tuberculosis in bones all the way back to about 8,000 BC. And uh, we, <laughs> interestingly enough, um, it was found in spinal cord fragments you have Egyptian mummies, which is about 2,400 years ago. And then it's also listed in the medical text from China, uh, 27, well, that's actually 2,700 BC. My apologies there. Uh, Hippocrates recorded it uh, in his book one of the epidemics, which was written about 400 BC. BCE, excuse me, he described a weakness of the lung, which was a fever and a cough. And this was referred to at the time as thesis, which, um, and, which was their name for it. And that name stuck around for a while. Um, here's his quote from the book, early in the beginning of spring and through the summer and towards the winter, many of those who had been gradually declining took to bed with symptoms of thesis. Many, and in fact, most of them died. Thesis makes it attacks chiefly between the ages of 18 and 35. So this is a young person's disease and it continues to be a young person's disease throughout history. Um, so in the Middle Ages, tuberculosis was called scrofula. Uh, infections uh, was seen sometimes in the neck and the lymph nodes. And tuberculosis can occur in many places. Primarily, it infects the lungs, but that's not the only place that it can infect you. They called it the king's evil or the king's touch because the belief among the people was that the king could cure you of the disease just by touching you. <clears throat> wasn't the case, but <laughs> it's nice to believe these things. Uh, it was also called the white plague of Europe, and that was due to the paleness of the patient. Um, in the early 17th century, so that's the 1600s, they had huge epidemic proportions. This is, an, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll see later that there are social implications associated with uh, plague. And this is, I don't know if you've ever heard of Edward Munch. He uh, created the image, the, painted the picture called The Scream. This is one of his pictures also uh, titled The Sick Child, 1885. So that was about the time of uh, the epidemic in Europe. Uh, it was the most common killer of American colonial adults as far as infectious diseases. London and New York were two of the very worst affected cities. 25% or one quarter of all deaths in New York City between 1810 and 1815 were caused by consumption of tuberculosis. So, I mean, that's, a, that's really a huge number if you think about, uh, you know, all the people you know, one in four die. So um, it continued in the 1600s throughout up to the 1790s, and it was just dramatically increasing all of that time. And then by 1800, tuberculosis was epidemic all throughout Europe. And by the late 1800s, 70 to 90 percent of urban populations of Europe and North America were infected with the TB bacillus, which is a bacterium. You know, it's the, the long, skinny ones. 1818-50, it's estimated that a quarter of Europeans died of tuberculosis. 1851 to 1910 in England and Wales, four million died. And that is about one half of the population uh, between 20 and 24 years old. This also uh, earned another name for this disease called the robber of youth because people died so young and were sick for years leading up to that. <clears throat> Pardon me. <coughs> the early investigators in 1700, John Manger, did an autopsy on a patient <clears throat> and he observed tubercles, which were uh, tubercles are kind of like if you think of a bead or something like that, but he observed them so small that he thought they resembled millet seed and they were present in all parts of the body. And if they are now, if they're, if these little seeds or tubercles are present in all parts of the body, it's called miliary tuberculosis after the millet seed uh, not name that it was given way back. <clears throat> 
In the upper right corner, you can see millet seed. Um, if you've ever had a bird, these are often put in bird cages for them to chew on and chomp on and you know eat the seeds or whatever. So they're very, very small. And those are about maybe a finger length or two finger lengths long. So in 1803, Rene Lenec found tubercles in all organs of the body, including the muscle. So at that time, <clears throat> researchers or scientists or medical physicians, they weren't sure if these were separate diseases or if they were one disease. And so the thought at that time where they were probably five or six different diseases. But Lenec really was convinced that all of these lesions were the same. And the ones in the lung were just different phases of the ones found elsewhere in the body. And, but it was the same pathological process. And in fact, he was, he was correct. So this is what um, a tubercle looks like in the lungs. The left-hand side, of course, is just the drawing. Uh, normal lung tissue looks like that, which is on the upper portion of the lung and the tubercles or the tuberculosis is the lower white um, uh, blobs, if you will. And you can see the an actual uh, lung here, an autopsied lung. And you can see uh, that there are um, a lot of white tubercles in this lung. So a very sick lung here that would make it very difficult for the patient to breathe, probably died. <laughs> so what is this caused by? Well, it's caused by an organism. Oh, there's a, ty there's a typo in this. It's myco. So it should be M-Y-C-O, mycobacterium tuberculosis. And it is a very tough and resilient bacteria. It was hard to, um, hard to find, you know, early scientists were looking and looking and looking uh, because of the germ theory. But frankly, it only grows on very special media. So on the left-hand side of your image here, this is the specialized media that uh, tuberculosis grows on. And you can see colonies of growth on that, um, on that green kind of media. Then the bacterium itself is over on the right. You can see it's colored purple here. It's not normally purple, but it, that's just to make it look attractive and stand out a little bit more. But you can see it's kind of the long, thin bacillus bacteria. So this bacterium is very well adapted to prolonged residence inside its human host, meaning it, it, is, it has a waxy coat, so it's very good at hiding itself from our immune system and protecting itself against phagocytes and you know, all kinds of things. So any part of the body's defenses that um, you know, go to attack it, it has kind of a solution for it. That doesn't mean it always wins. It just means that it's a little harder for us to, to uh, cure ourselves of it on our own, which is why there was such great deaths um, back in the 1800s. And TB, as I mentioned earlier, can attack any part of the body, kidney, spine, brain, lungs, muscles, you know, just pretty much anything. So what are the symptoms? So first, the air pack passages of your lungs, the pulmonary alveoli, which is the small little sacs inside your lung. That's where the bacteria gets in and it starts to replicate in there and it spreads throughout the, um, the alveoli. And of course, what's your body doing? Well, you know about inflammation now. So your body is going to send in fluid and phagocytes and everything to try and uh, attack those bacteria, which the bacteria are kind of causing some blockage in your lungs. And then once the fluid gets in there, that causes further blockage of those uh, alveoli and the transfer of oxygen into your body. So, you know, you're coughing, trying to expel the, the fluid and also the bacterium. And, you know, your body's working to try and get rid of it. But, you know, it's, it's not really very successful on its own because this is a tricky bacteria. So next, of course, you're going to have labor breathing and then a bad cough, cough, as I mentioned, and it's going to last, it will last probably throughout the disease um, unless you get treatment. Um, but you'll also have pain in your chest. Obviously, that bacteria are in there in your chest, you know, um, replicating and, you know, sending out their own, their own toxins or waste or whatever. You're also going to feel very tired. You know, if you can't breathe very well, you're just going to feel tired. <clears throat> you're likely to have a lot of weight loss and you might have chills and fever and night sweats and you'll have probably recurring low grade fevers because of this. You're not going to spike a really high temperature like, you know, you would with, you know, like maybe sepsis or some like just a really bad disease. Um, but um, you will have low grade fevers from time to time. Your body will fight it and then it will, the bacterium will kind of get a gain an advantage and then you'll spike the temperature in your body. So it just kind of is a little bit cyclical.
Now, the other thing that can happen is you can be exposed to tuberculosis and you can have what's called a latent infection. And this is where you actually have a tuberculosis or tuberculi bacilli that, be, that gets into your lungs, but your body is successful in kind of walling it off. So it's called a latent infection. You're going to have one little tubercle in your lung, but that's it. That's that's as far as it's ever going to get because your body has has won the challenge at the beginning. So approximately 10% of us in the United States have latent TB infection. So um, how do we get it? Well, um, there are people in the United States who have tuberculosis. If you've traveled to other countries, sat on an airplane and someone's coughing, they possibly could have tuberculosis and not know it or or even know it. Um, but so there is a, a possibility that, um, that the numbers are one out of 10 or one out of 15 people have um, a latent infection of tuberculosis. So this is just a little graphic showing uh, the different types of uh, tuberculosis. You can see on the left there, that's the latent infection. And that's the one that's really not very harmful to us. It might show up on an x-ray and it might be mistaken for um, uh, a cyst or a tumor. But um, once it's biopsied, they'll realize that it's it's not um, it's not a tumor. And then the middle one is cavitary tuberculosis, and this is where um, the tubercle or the bacteria they kind of ruptured, um, and so they've created this cavity. They're continuing to replicate, um, and then the one on the right is miliary tuberculosis, where it has spread throughout the lung in this particular case. So, what were the social effects in the 17th and 18th centuries? Well, very interesting. I find this part fascinating. This is why I love history so much. So in the 19th century, so that's the 1800s, tuberculosis or consumption was perceived in a somewhat romantic way. It became a fashionable disease due to the symptoms and the gradual march towards death. Um, so people who had, <clears throat> excuse me, who had cholera or dysentery or any other kind of infectious disease, it was kind of gross, right? You know, you had you had some bad bodily functions, if you will. But consumption, uh, it was just you had a little cough and you were weak and you weren't hungry. So anyway, it was it was fashionable, uh, and they equated the notion of suffering with positive connotations. So you were quiet and inoffensively sick. You were my your mind and your dignity remained intact. You could just lay in bed and you know read your book or you know visit with friends or whatever, um, and it allowed the sufferers to die well. And that's by you know not not having one of those um, you know indignified diseases. Um, so it's not an instant killer, and the patient could expect to live. Um, up to three years after they you know, started coughing. Um, and so they had time to settle their affairs, um, say their goodbyes and, um, you know, do all of those things that, you know, we often don't have time to do uh, once we die or before we die. <laughs> so by having consumption, uh, it reflected in the period's culture. So what do I mean by that? Well, the beauty standards at the time followed what the consumptive patient looked like. So people wanted to wanted to be thin. So weight loss and the lack of appetite allowed them to be very thin. They had skeletal bodies, you know, just, you know, seriously would lose weight, 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 weight. And they had pale or transparent skin. And that was highly valued at this time as well. They had a frequent low grade fever, as I mentioned earlier. And so they, because of the low grade fever, they might have sparkling or dilated eyes. They would have rosy cheeks and red lips. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> We'll get, I'll say more about that in a minute, but um, consumptive chic, that's what I'm calling it. It The fashion <clears throat> of the day helped you to appear to have the illness. So you wore these very tight pointed corsets that created a very narrow waist. And then you had these voluminous skirts. So you had this tiny waist and this, this huge skirt, which also um, highlighted the, the tiny waist. Um, and makeup, they lightened their skin. They reddened their lips and they colored their cheeks pink. So this is the start of makeup. This is when makeup started and it was due to trying to emulate tuberculosis, the disease of tuberculosis in the 1800s. So the stereotype of tuberculosis affecting an artistic person was also uh, 
prevalent in that time. And um, death robbed people of their youth and they then transformed them into something of a martyr. So there was a great many artists and um, in intellectuals that were affected by tuberculosis. I'll name just a few. You can look up a list of this and there, there are many. Um, so uh, some composers, Stravinsky and Chopin, both had and died of tuberculosis. Uh, literature, John Keats, Percy Shelley, Edgar Allan Poe, Robert Louis Stevenson, and the Bronte sisters all had tuberculosis. And I think most of them died. There may be one or two of those that did not die of tuberculosis, died of something else. But um, yeah, they all had tuberculosis. So the germ theory, as you know, was, was um, going, you know, being, being um, learned about and um, communicated throughout the world. Uh, and then a doctor in uh, Paris, Jean-Antoine Villami, uh, he was an army doctor and he proved using Koch's postulates that um, this was a contagious disease. He um, infected animals, healthy animals, with um, this tuberculosis that he got from probably a dead animal, like from a dead animal's lung, and showed that it did cause the disease. So then they knew, okay, it's a contagion, but you know what is causing it? We still don't know that. But in March of 1882, our amazing Dr. Robert Koch uh, isolated the tubercle bacillus and his headlines made, uh, or his discovery made headlines worldwide. This was a big discovery because people had been dying of tuberculosis for a long, long time. And once they had a name and a picture of it, you know, that was like, okay, we can, we can, we can solve this. You know, when COVID first came out, it was, it was, um, it was thought to be a virus, but it was still unknown. This is very early stages. And um, so once they identified it, it was like scientists were like, okay, now we know what it is. We can finally start to work on what to do uh, to treat it, to prevent it, et cetera. So after the discovery of the tuberculosis bacterium, the fashions changed again. So interestingly enough, women's skirts, and you can see in this picture, they were big, full skirts, as I mentioned. Um, and this is after the bacterium. So uh, remember, this, this was popular when people were trying to emulate the disease. But once they discovered it was a bacteria, then the fashions changed. So these big, wide, trailing skirts that drug across the ground um, were considered disease culprits. Women who were walking in the street or walking around the homes, et cetera, they were uh, they feared, and they probably were, bringing bacteria in on their skirts because people people spit. Uh, they spit tobacco. They spit just in general. And so they were worried they were bringing it in their homes. So fashions changed. So from in 1900, the dress on the left, the kind of peachy pink colored one, you can see that's a long trailing skirt. And by 1910, the, um, the skirt length had really gone up. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> And um, they still had somewhat of a narrow waist, but it wasn't the, the, the tiny, tiny waist. Um, and TV, TB can survive and spit for an entire day. So they were not they were not wrong about what they were bringing into their homes. And then once those hemlines rose, guess what else happened? Shoe styles were became big, became popular. People pretty much just wore functional shoes under their dresses. Um, but once you could see the shoes, well, women wanted those to be fashionable as well. So shoe fashions really took off. And um, there were a number of different shoes available at the time and continues to this day, obviously. Shoes are still important. So these were the courses that were worn to emulate the disease of tuberculosis. But after the disease was discovered to be a bacterium, they thought, oh my gosh, these corsets are harming our lungs. They're preventing the circulation of our blood. They're making us more sick. And these were heavily boned uh, corsets. So they would have these long, they, and they really did have bones like whale bones or uh, others that were carved into a flat surface. And so they had boning all the way around to push you up um, as you can see, and make the waist very narrow. And they would, you know, lace them very tightly around the waist. I mean, they, the reason fainting couches came into vogue was due to corsets. Uh, women would walk upstairs and because they could not breathe with their corset on, they would have to sit down on a fainting couch. And fainting couches were typically put up at the top of the stairs for women to faint after walking up the stairs. I'm so glad I don't live then.
So after uh, they decided that these boned corsets weren't very good, then there was something called good sense waste or health corsets. And these were made with elasticized fabric and that helped to alleviate the pressure on the ribs caused by these you know, very tightly boned uh, corsets. These were still, as you saw in the first picture, um, when I showed the comparison of the two dresses, women still wanted a narrow light waistline, but they weren't willing to, um, you know, to, to risk, um, you know, being more sick or whatever. Uh, so they, they switched over to these, um, these corsets. Another thing that has continued until this day, um, doctors began prescribing sunbathing as a treatment for tuberculosis. They thought the sun and the dry air would uh, help dry out the lungs and you know, create um, uh, better conditions for our body to fight the tuberculosis um, bacterium. So uh, this, again, people started getting tan and looking healthy because they had been in the sun. And so that continues to this day. So we still sun tan in order to look healthy. So you can see here the 30s, this is the 40s, and I think that's the 50s. I tried to get, um, you know, an ad from, or a, an image from each of the few centuries or a few decades that we've had. And then of course you're familiar with, you know, the 80s, 90s, 2000s. So the other fashion that changed was Victorian facial hair. So men at that time, you've probably seen movies or TV shows or something where men have these huge beards or they have big sideburns um, or mutton chops. I think they used to call them mutton chops, big sideburns and stuff. So they had this was this was very popular during uh, Victorian time, the 1800s up to about 1880, 1890. Uh, and then it changed. So facial hair was deemed dangerous as well. So here's Edwin Bowers, a doctor of the time, saying measles, scarlet fever, diphtheria, tuberculosis, whooping cough, common and uncommon colds, and a host of other infectious diseases can be and undoubtedly are transmitted via the whisker route. So what happened then? Men started shaving their hair, <laughs> shaving their faces. And here is a, a graph that shows facial hair trends from 1842 to 1972. So the orange... Uh, orange is um, um, sideburns, uh, the black is beards, mustaches is, is gray, and clean shaven is the white. So you can see that um, beards and uh, sideburns, if, et cetera, were very popular up until oh, the 1880s, 1890s, maybe even some remain towards the turn of the century, the 1900s, but um, it was strongly, strongly influenced by um, you know, the belief that whiskers were harboring uh, contagion, germs, tuberculosis, and women didn't want to kiss those beards. <laughs> so anyway, um, I'm going to talk a bit about the advances in diagnostic tools that were brought about by uh, consumption. And um, some of these are really, really important. All right, so stethoscope. Uh, in 1816, physicians, well, in the early 1800s, first and start physicians started to do physical exams. And one of the things they wanted to do was they wanted to listen to the internal sounds, both of the heart and of the lungs. And in tuberculosis, this was very important because they would hear uh, the fluid and, you know, the, um, the, the, the lung sounds associated with tuberculosis. And so Lynette, we talked about him a little bit earlier, he invented the very first stethoscope. And this was just pretty much a simple rod, but it did help to amplify the sounds and it reduced the physical contact between the physician and their patient. So oftentimes physicians would go and they would just put their ear on top of patient, patient, patient's chest. Uh, and so this would reduce the contact. Um, and here he is uh, listening with his first stethoscope or <laughs> one of them he invented on a little patient listening to the long sounds of, of this little child. So next, George Kamen uh, in 1852 of New York, he uh, invented the first stethoscope with earpieces for each ear. So, you know, the stethoscope we have today looks somewhat similar to this. Uh, and that means that the sound is collected in that one uh, one kind of area down at the bottom, the, the trumpet, if you will. And then it go travels up through the earpieces to our ears. And it was used for, as it says here, more than a hundred years without much modification. 
Uh, and then in the six, 1960s, um, a cardiologist, Dr. David Littman, you might have heard of Littman stethoscopes, uh, he was a Harvard Medical School professor, and he created um, uh, the, uh, a new stethoscope. And this one actually magnified the sounds so that you could hear differences in lung sounds, differences in heart sounds, um, like hear the difference between, you know, a regular heartbeat and a heart murmur and, you know, the different ventricles opening and closing and, and then lung sounds too. So this is the stethoscope that's in use today uh, and it continues to advance. You know, some of the stethoscopes are are just, you know, they're very expensive, but they're, they just can really give you amazing sounds uh, from inside the body. So also at this time, a German physicist, Wilhelm Röntgen, he was one of many scientists who were researching vacuum tubes. So there was, you know, physicists were studying all kinds of, um, of things at this time. And one of the things they were studying were vacuum tubes and also uh, light rays. So he covered uh, a tube, a vacuum tube, with completely with, with black, but then he observed kind of a faint green glow on the outside of that tube. And other scientists had seen this too, but they just ignored it. They said, you know, it's whatever, it's an artifact. We don't care about that. We're studying the tubes. But he decided he wanted to find out what that was. So because he didn't know what it was, he started first to call them x-rays because they were light rays, but he didn't know where they came from or what they were. Uh, also, at this time, scientists did not believe that light could pass through anything opaque, so it couldn't go through solid things. You know, it could only go through windows and, you know, air and, you know, other things like that. It couldn't couldn't go through anything like, you know, a bone. However, Rotkin said that certain rays of lights could pass through substances and they would leave shadows of solid objects. So that um, and then he also learned that X-rays would pass through human tissue and that would allow bones and tissues to be visible. So he discovered in 1895 x-rays accidentally. So again, he was studying uh, that vacuum tube and the green light that emanated from it. This is his wife's hand with a ring on it. And this is the very first x-ray that was ever taken. Uh, and this was by Rodkin. Pretty cool. Has a ring all the way up here. Hmm. She was very stylish, I guess. <laughs> um, so the discovery of this x-ray machine spread worldwide. Uh, and within a year, doctors in both uh, Europe and the United States were using x-rays to find bullet fragments, um, bone fractures, uh, kidney stones, uh, swallowed objects. My mother, when she was a baby, she a toddler, she swallowed an open safety pin. Uh, so they x-rayed her little, her little belly with one of those. So um, anyway, important, very, very important um, um, discovery or invention. So Wilhelm, uh, Rodkin received the very first Nobel Prize in Physics in 1901. Uh, the 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 whatever the, the introduction or the nomination at the time said in recognition of the extraordinary services he has rendered by the discovery of the remarkable rays subsequently named after him. Well, they weren't ever really named after him, were they? They were they, the X-ray name stuck. <laughs> and so now. With this x-ray machine, this is, a, of course, a more modern x-ray, but I'm using it just to demonstrate uh, that tuberculosis, which we can see in the graphic image on the left, uh, we can see little bacteria in there, little tubercles, actually, uh, that have the bacterium in them. And then if you look over on the right-hand side, the to our view, the left lung on on this particular image um, shows the kind of white diffuse area there and that is a tubercle uh, with um, with bacteria tuberculosis bacteria within it remarkable i'm sure it was just amazing at the time so in 1882 remember robert Koch developed uh, discovered micro mycobacterium tuberculosis and then in 1895 Rontgen discovered x-rays so by 1905, doctors can make a definitive diagnosis of tuberculosis. They could demonstrate abnormalities in patient chest radiograph or x-ray, and they could find tubercle bacilli in his or her sputum. They had the patient cough up, they could look at it under a microscope and they could see it. So that was pretty remarkable. So in the 18, I'm just going back a little bit to, um, uh, you know, the 
uh, outbreak of it, if you will, in the 1800s and the 1900s, 80% of those who developed active tuberculosis died of it. Now, that's not the latent version. That's the active version. Uh, in the United States, until the 1940s, it was the most common cause of death among young adults. So, I mean, you probably have great grandparents or maybe grandparents uh, that were around at that time, maybe born at that time. So it's pretty remarkable. It's just, uh, it's, it's really kind of scary. So then around 1908, uh, a test for it uh, was created to diagnosis, diagnose it. And that's just inserting a little bit of um, the, the uh, remnants of the uh, that bacteria into your skin to see if, um, you know, you created an immune response. If you did, obviously you had been infected with it because you were creating antibodies and having that immune response that we learned about earlier. So treatment, the 1800s to 1950s didn't change a lot, um, more so in the uh, early part of the 19th century, but um, originally it was cod liver oil, oil, vinegar massages, inhaling hemlock or turpentine, ugh, uh, and that was in the 1800s. By the mid 1800s to the mid 1900s, lana letto latte, which is Italian, you probably heard of lattes, uh, which means warmth rest and good food. So that was the treatment um, just to try and keep healthy and hopefully your body would do the rest. So at that time, a major reversal of the disease progress and the epidemic status began to fall. And um, it wasn't only because of the Leno Leto Latte, it was likely three different reasons, which were improved socioeconomic conditions. So people had better uh, standards of living. They had better nutrition. They had better uh, job uh, environments, better home environments. And then there was also application of some public health measures, which hadn't happened much to this time. Um, there was this dawning re re realization that tuberculosis was an infectious disease caused by a bacterium. And so they started um, pulling people into what they called sanatoriums. And a sanatorium is where you would go if you had tuberculosis to try and help you get well, and also to kind of keep you away from others, uh, just the general public. I mean, you weren't like prison, imprisoned or anything, but it was just, um, you know, like a specialized hospital um, where they could they could help to treat you. So in 1943, the antibiotic streptomycin uh, was discovered and then developed into a drug. Uh, and that did work initially, uh, but um, eventually it, it stopped working pretty well in a short period of time. So then scientists discovered isonazid and the combination of those two seemed to help. Um, and, but now uh, there is actually a four drug cocktail that is commonly used. And this is for drug susceptible mycobacterium tuberculosis. And why do I say susceptible? Well, because there are some drug resistant ones, but prevention, <clears throat> excuse me. So I mentioned building and the maintenance of sanatoriums for the sick. And so the, the preventing the spread became um, the most um, rigorous method of um, preventing the spread of the disease. Um, I mentioned women's skirts, men's beards. So all of those were, were part of this and along with the sanatorium. But then there was also a huge uh, health crusades. Public health information uh, was distributed and there was one called the Children's Health Campaign, also called the Modern Health Campaign. Christmas Seals, the program Christmas Seals began in Denmark to raise money for tuberculosis programs. The United States and Canada in 1907 and 1908 created the National Tuberculosis Association, which later became the American Lung Association, which obviously is now around. Here are a couple of ads. Um, on the left, we have one from the 1920s, I believe. Uh, it says, Fight Tuberculosis Red Cross Christmas Seal Campaign. So the Red Cross joined into the, uh, the, the fight early on. Uh, and then we have now, you can still um, make donations and put stamps of uh, Christmas seals onto your envelopes at Christmas time or any time to help uh, the National Lung Association to continue to do research and provide public health campaigns. So here's another uh, part of the public health campaign. Children should go outside and play. They need to be healthy. They need good food. They need good sleep. And um, it says here, the city that fails to provide public pay playgrounds may be forced to provide tuberculosis sanatorium. So, you know, aimed not only at individuals, but also at um, 
people applying public pressure on their government officials. And here's some, is there's a lot of these signs around. Be a good fellow. Don't spit on the streets. Do not spit. Don't spit. For my sake, don't spit. So there's just a lot of, um, of, of notices to try and prevent men from spitting. As I mentioned, it was, it's common at that time. You know, I, I think it's become even more common for a while. It was not common, probably due to all of these campaigns and, you know, I, I remember my mother telling my brother, stop spitting, don't spit. Um, so, you know, maybe that was a, a remnant of, of this public health campaign. And here's the modern health crusaders, the kids, they have they have chores and I wash my hands, I wash my body, I kept my fingers and my pencils clean, I brushed my teeth, I played outdoors. I was in bed 10 hours or more last night. I drank four glasses of water, I, I was in, just all of the things we know today that are uh, vital to keeping, uh, maintaining good health. Um, and then eventually a vaccination was created uh, <clears throat> and this was called um, the VCG vaccine. And it was developed from a bovine or cow strain of tuberculosis. And interestingly, that is likely how the uh, organism actually first got transmitted to humans. It, was found kind of in the soil or whatever. And then it's likely that it um, mutated into a cow disease, uh, cow tuberculosis, if you will. And then interaction with humans um, in you know the early, early, early years of human history, we started uh, developing agriculture and interacted with cows. Um, and so that's likely how um, it crossed over into us. But I digress. Anyway, Albert Calmet and Camille Garin, uh, they developed the vaccine, which is the Bacille Calmet Garin, also called the BCG from the Bacille, the initial B, Calmet, initial C, and Garin, initial G. It was first used on, on humans in 1921 in France, but not until after about 1940, 45, did it get widespread um, acceptance. You know, vaccines were still a fairly new thing. And you know, people were reluctant. So today, of course, it's very easy to di diagnose. And in most cases, it is easy to cure as well. Uh, if you get the right drug cocktail, meaning not just one drug, um, and uh, then you are, you are very likely to recover. So 95% of the time. And, you know, if you get the late version, you're not going to get sick anyway. So, um, but despite the uh, the ease of diagnosis and treatment now there are a number the number of new cases is steadily increasing there were 8 million in 1997 there are 10 there were 10 million in 20 2005 there's probably 12 or 15 million by now um, and more people will be infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis this year than ever before Ooh. So in the United States there were uh, almost 9000 cases reported in 2020 it has fallen steadily since 1992 in contrast to the rest of the world, which is increasing. Um, but this, this progress is only found in rich industrialized nations. So, you know, Europe, United States, Australia, um, you know, some of the, just the wealthier countries. But you've got to remember that the poor developing countries make up 86% of the world's population. So they're, therefore, um, tuberculosis can spread um, you know, among all of those peoples. So it is a global pandemic and it kills someone every 22 seconds. That sounds that's shocking to you, isn't it? Because it's so rare here, but, um, you know, in the rest of the world, it's not rare. Uh, there are about 10 million who are sick with tuberculosis. Uh, in 2020, over a million, million and a half people died. And it is the world's top infectious disease killer. I know it's just, it's, it's amazing. So half of the new cases, <laughs> excuse me, half of new cases come from five Asian countries, Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Pakistan, Philippines, and then also some other very prominent areas are in Africa, in particular, Nigeria and South Africa, but kind of all of the Southern area of Africa. <clears throat> so tuberculosis worldwide, here's just a graph. Uh, in 2017, 10 million new cases, 1.6 million deaths, 558 
thousand MDR TB cases, which I will discuss. But here you can see the graphic of um, where the prominence of cases is. You can see Africa, Pakistan, Philippines, Indonesia, they're all in the darker red uh, areas of Central uh, and Southern America, uh, as well as uh, Russia and some of the um, uh, and some of China are, are also, uh, you know, somewhat high incident areas. So doesn't affect us. It's not here. Should we care? Why should we care? Well, because it has a, a great, it has a very great possibility of recurring here. So in the 1970s, um, you know, the disease had really kind of, you know, abated. And so the Bureau of Tuberculosis Control thought we don't need to have um, you know, so much money going to tuberculosis. We need it for other health diseases. We need it for new roads. We need, you know, whatever. Um, and so they made some severe budget cuts to the tuberculosis program. Staffing and shortages, staffing and services shrank. Um, outpatient clinics went from 28, 24 to eight. And at the same time, the number of homeless were climbing. Also drug addiction was expanding, heroin, cocaine, alcohol mental institutions, there was a great move to allow mental patients uh, release. And so they were just being released and most of them, most many of them became homeless and were just on the streets. And then also at that time, a large number of immigrants were arriving with uh, tuberculosis. And of course, later on in the early 80s, HIV, uh, you know, really became um, a big problem as well. So with this you know, pot of bad, <laughs> just ugh, all the bad things happening at the same time, the great cases in New York City soared. So that's a warning sign for the rest of us that we should care. And the other reason is that there are now multi-drug resistant tuberculosis strains. So uh, they are resistant to the two most powerful TB drugs, Isonazid and Mifampin. So how did this happen and how does it still happen? Well, if they if you use the drugs incorrectly or you have an incorrect formulation, uh, you know, the, the drug wears out over time and then you are taking it, it's not doing you any good. Um, and so by doing that, a lot of resistant organisms formed. And this, this you know, the number of uh, resistant uh, organisms is expanding. Uh, the World Health Organization's organization reported 500,000 new cases of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis per year occurring now. Only one in three cases received treatment. Ooh. And the COVID pandemic further spread the resistant strains. So, um, um, you know, if you are, if you are sick and you have a coughing disease, you know, obviously you're going to spread that. Um, but then also if your body is trying to fight another viral infection, um, you may not be taking your medications properly and your body is weakened. And so um, multi-drug resistant organisms can um, get the better of you. Now, this is the one that we should really worry about. This is extensively drug resistant TB. There are 44,000 new cases of extensively resistant tuberculosis annually around the world. In the United States, there were 63 cases reported in between 1993 and 2011, which is not high, but these bugs are totally drug resistant, meaning no antibiotic is gonna kill them. So what's gonna happen? Oh, that's not good. Unless we develop additional treatments, then at some point, this, these multi-resistant or totally drug resistant uh, tuberculosis will spread throughout the world. And we'll be back where we started. So treatment success obviously declines with increasing drug resistance. On the left-hand side, the, the tall navy kind of blue, 86% uh, of cases have been uh, cured, if you will, from uh, regular, um, just regular drug therapy, rifampin and oxonacid. The drug resistant ones that are resistant to some of the drugs, uh, about 59% of people are cured with those. And the extreme drug resistance, only about 43% of people are cured. So the other 57% go on to die and to spread the disease during their short lifetime. So Sir John Crofton in 1959 said the greatest disaster that can happen to a patient with tuberculosis is that his organisms 
meaning the tuberculosis organisms, become resistant to two or more of the standard drugs. The development of drug resistance may be a tragedy not only for the patient himself, but also for others, where he can affect other people with his drug resistant organisms. So yes, we should care. We should care more than we do. We should be working on um, defeating tuberculosis in other areas uh, just so that you know we don't face, well, not just so, <laughs> for humanitarian reasons. And then also because um, you know we, we will likely see it again someday. So remember, no spitting. Thanks so much for joining me this time, and um, I'll talk to you again soon.